Welcome to Whiskey Cask, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 842 for October 25th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. I always thought that, you know, we started because he built a distillery or bought a distillery. And and really, when you dig into the story of him being a pharmaceutical salesperson and, and kind of leveraging what was happening in Louisville and, and around in a, in a way that would deliver a product that he needed, he didn't have the, even with all his connections and stuff, really didn't have the capital to go build a distillery or buy one. Last time around, we talked with John Glazer about the 20th anniversary of Compass Box. Campbell Brown is celebrating an anniversary this year, too. The 150th anniversary of Old Forester Bourbon, founded back in 1870 by his great-great-grandfather, George Garvin Brown. We'll clear up some of the mythology surrounding Old Forester, which was the original brand Brown Foreman was founded on, but fell by the wayside over the years as the company's other whiskey brands became more prominent. That has changed now with the opening of the Old Forester Distillery in downtown Louisville on Main Street's Whiskey Row. My conversation with Campbell Brown is coming up on Whiskey Cast in depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, and on behind the label. They decided to put us in the back of the banknotes, and they've just redone it, so we'll be there for at least another 10 years. The news is next on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Hey, whiskey fans, I'm Gabriel Cartarella, brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch whiskey, Dewar's. You could probably guess I've got a lot of stories, but for me, the good ones have one thing in common. They're best told over a glass of whiskey. So hit pause, grab your bottle of Dewar's, and let's get back to this episode of Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. Richard Patterson celebrated his 50th anniversary at White and Mackay last month by formally announcing his plans to start easing into retirement, but not quite all the way. He'll still have a role at the Dalmore, while his apprentice Greg Glass is taking on more of the heavy lifting with Jura, Federcairn, and the White and Mackay blends. Think of it as the David Stewart model, Sort of like David Stewart turning over all of the heavy lifting within William Grant and Sons to Brian Kinsman a few years ago, while still being hands-on at the Balvenie. Now, last time around, I reported on the plans for Wolf Craig Distillery near Sterling. While it is still in the planning approval process and will not begin production until at least 2022, there's word this week that Richard Patterson has agreed to become the master blender there, while continuing his work with the Dalmore. There's a natural connection at play here. Former White and Mackay CEO Michael Lunn is leading the Wolf Craig project. Of course, he and Richard Patterson worked closely together during Lunn's years there. Three years ago this month, the and McLeod Distillers acquired the rights to the Rosebank single malt brand from Diageo, and announced plans to reopen the original Rosebank Distillery in Falkirk. That deal also included all of Diageo's remaining stocks of Rosebank casks, and on Wednesday, the first in a series of annual limited-edition Rosebank bottlings was unveiled. Rosebank Release 1 is a 30-year-old whiskey distilled back in 1990, And Gordon Dundas of Ian McLeod joined us on the Whiskey Wednesday webcast that night. Rosebank was a very different animal. It was a whiskey that was driven very much by its spirit style because of its uniqueness of triple distillation, which says to you, would say light and sort of quite a light whiskey. And then you use worm tub condensers, which are a big heavier style, produce a sulfier, more sulfury, heavier spirit in that condenser element compared to a shell and tube. 
So it was always a whiskey that was driven by that sort of fruity floral element that was created, but it had a bit of weight to it. This 30-year-old is a fantastic, um, really fantastic uh, example of Rosebank, matured in ex-bourbon hogsheads and also in old sherry casks as well, refill sherry casks. So it's got some really, uh, you know, not bold cask flavors for sure, but a lot of that spirit coming through after 30 years. Wonderful whiskey. Only 4,350 bottles of Rosebank's 30-year-old release one will be available worldwide. The price tag, 1,600 pounds a bottle. That's about $2,100 U.S. at current exchange rates. As for the status of the distillery, work was halted earlier this year because of COVID-19 health restrictions in Scotland. Gordon Dundas told us they are hoping to resume work at the site soon, But it now looks as though Rosebank will not reopen until sometime in 2022. Other new whiskeys announced this week. The McAllen is not easing up after last week's unveiling of the Red Collection. This week, the distillery released the latest whiskey in its fine and rare collection, the 1993 Vintage. It's a 27-year-old single malt from a single sherry-seasoned American oak hogshead cask with just 256 bottles available. They went on sale this week with a suggested retail price of $18,000 each. Glenn Farkless had planned to release a 60-year-old single malt earlier this month at the Whiskey Show in London, but of course COVID-19 kept that from happening. Now that whiskey will go on sale in time for the holidays with just 105 bottles available at a price of 19,500 pounds each. That's about $25,500. By the way, this is not the oldest Glenn Farkless release on record. That was the 63-year-old Sapphire Edition released earlier this year. And while I'm talking about festival releases... Compass Box has a new whiskey out in partnership with La Maison du Whisky, the legendary Paris whiskey shop that also promotes Whiskey Live Paris each September. Of course, that show was also canceled because of COVID-19. But Compass Box's This Is Not a Festival Whiskey blended scotch is a reminder of what we have lost whiskey-wise this year. It's available exclusively through the La Maison du Whisky website for €109 Euros a bottle while it lasts. Meanwhile, Jim Beam is betting that the travel retail market will recover next year from the economic damage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's releasing Jim Beam Lineage, a new bourbon collaboration between master distiller Fred No and his son Freddie. Lineage is a 15-year-old bourbon bottled at 55% ABV, and it'll be the first Jim Beam expression to carry Freddie No's name. Of course, Freddie has been creating the Little Book series of whiskeys for the past four years now, and has been tapped to eventually take over for Fred when he retires in the near future. The whiskey will be available early next year, It'll sell for around $250 a bottle. Angel's Envy will be releasing its annual Cask Strength Edition November 1st. This year's release came in at 60.2% ABV and will be available in the U.S. for around $200 a bottle. I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at the Whiskey Cast website. Bourbon Hall of Fame master distiller Jim Rutledge has a new bourbon out. He's been working with Blue Run Spirits, a new company founded by a group of whiskey lovers with experience at Nike, Facebook, and other companies. They brought Jim in to handle the important part, the whiskey. He tracked down a 13-year-old Kentucky straight bourbon for Blue Run's first release, It'll be available at retailers in Kentucky and Georgia for around $170 a bottle while it lasts. In the meantime, Jim has already created the next Blue Run whiskey. No word yet on whether it'll be out in time for the holidays. I've reported many times over the past few months on the impact of the Trump administration's 
25% tariff on imports of single malt whiskies from Scotland and Northern Ireland. That tariff has resulted in imports of Scotch whiskies falling by about 25% between last October and this past August, with a value of around $200 million. The impact has been much smaller in Northern Ireland, though. Several Northern Ireland whiskey makers held a virtual tasting with whiskey writers and the British ambassador to the U.S. on Wednesday. The Irish Whiskey Association represents distillers on both sides of the Irish border. Executive Director William Lavelle brought us up to date on the impact. We've been fortunate that 99.93, I think is the official percentage, uh, of Irish whiskey is tariff-free to the U.S. That means all of the whiskey from Ireland and then the vast, vast bulk of whiskey from Northern Ireland. As you know, blended whiskies are by far the most popular category of Irish whiskey exports. And that applies, of course, to Northern Ireland as well. And blended whiskies from the United Kingdom are not included in tariffs. That doesn't mean it's all peaches and cream for Ireland's distillers, though. Irish cream liqueurs are also included in the tariff, with other liqueurs and cordials from throughout Europe and many smaller distillers on both sides of the border also make those liqueurs in addition to their whiskies. Kieran Mulgrew of Belfast-based Nish Drinks produces the Quiet Man whiskies and the St. Brendan's Irish Cream Liqueur. The tariff on Irish Cream Liqueur is also 25%, and to be honest, that has been more significant in terms of its impact than the tariff would have been in the Irish whiskey category for the reasons that William mentioned. Uh, so that has been tough now, to be honest. There's there's no getting away from that. It's the reality of it. British Secretary of State Liz Truss has been leading the UK's negotiations with the Trump administration, aimed at sorting out a new free trade agreement to take effect when the UK completely leaves the European Union at the end of this year. And speaking of leaving... William Grant & Sons CEO Simon Hunt has stepped down after nearly five years on the job. JustDrinks.com first reported the news on Thursday. There's no word on Hunt's future plans. Chief Financial Officer Giles Wilson and Chairman Glenn Gordon will be taking over his duties until a new CEO is named. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at WhiskeyCast.com. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. The Spirit of Toronto Festival's online whiskey masterclasses continue with Hinch Irish Whiskey's Aaron Flaherty on October 30th and Graham Cruikshank of Aberlauer November 1st. Villa Conthor in Limburg, Germany has a William Grant & Sons Halloween dinner and whiskey tasting on October 31st. The Whiskey Obsession Festival is still on for November 4th at the Armature Works in Tampa, Florida. The Scaled Down Oslo Whiskey Festival is November 6th and 7th in Oslo, Norway. Happy Land author Wright Thompson will have an online charity event with Julian Van Winkle on November 16th. Tickets include a signed copy of Happy Land, along with a raffle ticket for a bottle of Happy Van Winkle bourbon. And the proceeds benefit Chef Edward Lee's Lee Initiative to help restaurant workers get through the pandemic. By the way, Wright Thompson is scheduled to join us on the next Happy Hour webcast this coming Friday evening. Bonhams will have its next whiskey auction November 20th and 21st in Hong Kong. That auction includes a complete set of the 54 bottles in the Ichiro's card series of whiskeys from the old Hanyu distillery in Japan. And finally, the rescheduled Stockholm Beer and Whiskey Festival is scheduled for November 26th through the 29th in Stockholm, Sweden. Remember, all in-person events are subject to change on short notice depending on public health restrictions. So please check with event organizers before you make any travel plans. We are updating the calendar at whiskeycast.com throughout the week 
as we get updates on postponements and new dates for 2021 events. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states and three continents, and online, too. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Back in 1870, a Louisville pharmaceutical salesman by the name of George Garvin Brown decided to get into the whiskey business. He bought whiskey from three distilleries in the area, blended and bottled them, and named his whiskey after a popular doctor of the day. 150 years later, Old Forester is now one of the oldest bourbon brands still being made today. Of course, Brown's descendants now make the whiskey that goes into Old Forester, but it's one of the few brands that survived Prohibition, two world wars, and a big decline in bourbon's popularity during the 70s and 80s. Today, George's great-great-grandson, Campbell Brown, is the managing director of Old Forester and a member of Brown Foreman's board of directors. We talked via StreamYard the other day. Campbell was in his office on the top floor of the Old Forester Distillery on Louisville's downtown Whiskey Row. I know you had really pushed to get the new distillery open, not only for everything you needed for production, but also to make sure it was ready for the 150th anniversary. And yeah. now you can't have it open, right? That's right. Yeah. So we had a bunch of really awesome plans in place for the summer, really coinciding around our annual meeting in July, but even some stuff leading up to that. Uh, obviously, that we understood pretty quickly that that probably wasn't going to happen. And uh, we pivoted in a lot of different ways. I think with the distillery, um, you know, that the thing we're trying to balance there is that we're actually, you know, we're, we're bottling there. We've got production people there. And, and for us, those are our frontline essential workers because, you know, if we can't do the bottling, um, we're going to have a problem. If we can't, um, you know, be, be distilling there or, you, you know, we, we're processing a lot of the single barrels, the whiskey row stuff. And so you just don't want to expose them to the uh, any risk around infection or, or getting a cold or whatever it is. So we just have really locked that place down and we'll keep it that way uh, for a while. We've been pretty fortunate there uh, thus far. And we've done, you know, some of the, um, the curbside that's been really a lot of people have been taking advantage of uh, around downtown and, and other distilleries in state. And it's, I think it's worked well for people. It certainly keeps us on our toes and, and uh, gives us a chance to kind of stay connected and 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 maybe um, drop a couple of nice products from time to time um, in a fun, surprising way. Sometimes it's not as fun, right? Like sometimes it's uh, you know it's it, it's a bit of a logistical nightmare. But I, I think we've actually had a really enjoyable time doing it down at the distillery. I know you would have greatly preferred to be able to uh, show off the 150th anniversary batch proof, though, with. Uh, people at the distillery and a party and all that, right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's nothing quite like seeing the expressions on people's faces when they get to taste something that we believe to be really good. Um, and we haven't been able to do that, you know, other than, you know, maybe with a few friends or, or some colleagues when it got done. But yeah, I mean, we would have had some really fun events at George's. We probably would have done, um, you know, a nice dinner, a Q&A. We would have had some of my cousins and family members there, um, you know, some past employees. We really were going to use it as an opportunity to do some in-person storytelling with a lot of the folks that have been a part of the brand for, 
you know, 50 years or so. Um, and we couldn't do it. You know, we've, we've done some pivoting like everyone he does with the virtual stuff and the, and some online interviews, but it doesn't really uh, match up with the power of being able to, you know, have conversations face to face with people, or or enjoy walk them through a, a tasting with Jackie or or, uh, or Chris or myself or anyone really. Um, that would have been a much more of an enjoyable experience, I think, certainly for us. Uh, and I think I think it would have given more exposure to people as well, a, a chance to try it. Now the. 150th anniversary batch proof is actually three different whiskeys. Uh, I know Chris and Jackie did the heavy lifting on this, but explain how it was uh, created. Yeah, I mean, Chris started this, um, gosh, I think even before I took the job, the, uh, we knew we were going to have 150th anniversary. Um, although COVID's done its best to kind of prohibit that from even happening, but um, we, we knew we would be celebrating a pretty large milestone. And so he had already identified some some barrels that he thought might be um, suitable down the road to use and and um, and then we you know we had some conversations we, we hired Jackie's I can um, she got involved in the project and um, really I think between Chris's uh, wonderful understanding of history and, and Jackie being as creative as she is and also you know, wanting to do something that was truly kind of representative and, and a celebration of, of how we all started. They came up with that great idea of batching, um, taking 150 of these barrels that we'd set aside and, and put in three distinct batches, each one representing a, a different kind of, I'd say, um, macro characteristic of the old Forester taste profile. And then, you know, kind of do that to recognize the three original distilleries that George used uh, when he started all of this in 1870, which were the Mattingly distillery, which ultimately we ended up purchasing and then Melwood and, and Atherton. And so, you know, then the fun part for marketing people is, okay, what's it going to look like? You know, we looked at a bunch of different ways to dress it up and looking at glass and old molds and, you know, and, and so we, we really like where we landed both on the, um, the specialness of how that product looks, and then certainly how um, we've been able to deliver three fairly unique expressions that uh, do a nice job of um, highlighting characteristics that people, I think, have come to appreciate about Old Forester. And you mentioned something interesting in there that uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, George Garvin Brown was actually a whiskey sorcerer back right. in the day. And a lot of folks figured, well, he just started a distillery. No, that wasn't until, what, 1902, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I was the same person. I, I didn't know. I, no. I was like, what do you mean? He was a he was blending and he was just, per, like, he, I always thought that, you know, we started because he built a distillery or bought a distillery. And, and really, when you dig into the story of him being a pharmaceutical salesperson and, and kind of leveraging what was happening in Louisville and, and around in a, in a way that would deliver a product that he needed. He didn't have the, even with all his connections and stuff, really didn't have the capital to go build a distillery or buy one. And, and so like a lot of people have, have done today, even, you know, you go find a couple of people that produce pretty good quality stuff and you make your own. And, and that's kind of how he started and was able to um, create at least uh, enough of a, a vine enterprise and had some interest in there that he ultimately with partners, started um, uh, Brown Foreman and, and created a, a, a company and a business and, and then began distilling himself. And we need to clarify the uh, claim that's been made for years about Old Forester being the first bottled bourbon, because historians have pointed out that there were bottles of bourbon before right. 1870, but Old Forester was the first one to exclusively come in bottles. Uh, yeah. People had barrels before then. They were selling both barrels and bottles, right? Yeah, I, exactly. I think that I think you know where I, I, I find that George had demonstrated a, a certain degree of kind of courage and entrepreneurship is that he decided to make the investment that I think was around ensuring a consistent and quality product by deciding to only make it available by the bottle. 
And that required an investment in glass. It required an investment in, in you know, labels and, and everything else that was, uh, you know, other people were doing. But that wasn't the only horse that they were betting on. And, and that's all he did. He really kind of, um, I think, sized his business appropriately, delivered something he felt good about, proud about, proud of, and made it available in one way. So thereby ensuring he had a, a consistent and quality product um, and it couldn't be adulterated like it often was back in, in those times. And we don't even want to think about what they were putting in whiskey barrels no. at this point. It's just a, yeah, kind of sickening to think about what they were actually doing. Right. So back to the whiskey now, this batch proof 150th anniversary. I'm sipping on batch number one right now. And uh, have uh, posted my tasting notes already on the website for batch three, and I'll get to batch two here soon. Great. But tell me about the differences you get in the three batches. Well, I mean, I've, I tell people who will listen that, you know, I'm not, I don't have a Jackie's I can palate. I don't know what marzipan tastes like, and I don't know what a, a lot of things that she can pick up smell like or what they would be. Um, and so I'm a simple man and I, I have a, I do find that I do, you know, I, I like a fruitier, uh, sweeter kind of a bourbon ex, uh, experience. And, and I do get that on the first one. And when we did a thing the other day, I did find that the third one, um, originally when I tasted it, it, it was kind of my third favorite because I think it was just a little bit more on the robust side, more than I would be, you know, generally kind of interested in drinking as a, as a regular old forester for me. But I, I just, I actually, I, I think I liked how different it was from the, the, the lighter proof and the sweeter version, which is, I mean, I think what's the lighter one, 124, 125. So it's not that big a difference, but, but I, to me, the third one is just a, a much more, a nuttier, bigger kind of even spicy uh, version of what one delivered in, for me. And, and so I think because it, and, and, you know, I've been drinking a lot of birthday bourbon. I probably shouldn't like boast about that, but I have been, and, uh, must be nice. It's okay. It's, a, it's a perk. It, it doesn't suck. And so the third, and so I find that one diff, you know, even this third one, very different from what I'm tasting in the birthday bourbon this year. And I just really enjoyed it. So, um, uh, so that the, I guess I, I have, I'm proud that I can actually pick up a difference between the three because I'm not, I think I always say I'm a great consumer. I'm not a great, um, you know, I don't have a, a refined palate to speak of. And I know what a battle, you know, like if I've been taught how to identify things that shouldn't be there in an old forester. Um, and so unless I, I'm picking up on something like that, all I taste is is something that I, I'm used to tasting. It'll it'll somewhat be different because of um, often just how long it's been in the barrel or, or what what proof we end up bottling it at. But I think to come around, I like the three. I, originally, I started on one, and then now I'm finding that I like the three quite a bit. Now, when consumers see these, they'll uh, they'll actually have to look really closely at the uh, bottle to see which batch is which because they're all going to be mixed up, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how they're getting out there. I know that we're we're not. I think um, we we had no plans to like. Okay, we're going to put one in Kentucky and Ohio. Two is going to go out west. Three is going to go to the northeast. I mean, I think we the way that this was kind of will we'll go out is that everyone's going to get a little bit of everything. Um, and then we've done. You know, we we I didn't even think somebody said like, oh. That was nice. You put the you put what batch is on the actual carton versus making everybody open up the cartons to see if they're getting the batch one, two, or three. I'm like, oh, that would have been cruel and unusual. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you it'll say right there if it's one, two, or three. Um, hopefully, you get a chance to try them all, and, and even luckier if you get a chance to buy one of each. Now, you mentioned that you're a simple person with simple tastes, yet you get to make the choices on the president's choice version of Old Forester. So uh, how do you do that if you, uh, as you describe yourself, are a yeah. simple person? Well, um, I have some help. It's kind of the most nerve wracking period of my year is when Jackie kind of drops off typically um, a couple boxes of samples. Like she'll 
she said, look, I'm not going to give you anything here that's not delicious, but you need to go through and, and she'll give me for each barrel. Um, I'll have th- uh, three different um, samples, each at various proofs, none probably below 115 or 110. And I take a box and a half of those home. Um, and I'm like, like I was in school, I'm a last minute person. And so I get a couple phone calls and she's like, where are you on this? I'm like, oh, I haven't really started yet, Jackie. You know, and COVID was crazy because I had my kids all over the place and was trying to get them around. So I finally knuckled down and got it done. And, and um, I spent about three and a half days kind of just taking my time. And, and again, because I don't, you know, I, I can't just put it in my mouth and swirl it around and figure out what I like. You know, oftentimes if I find something like, God, that's great. I'll then actually want to drink it, you know, and, and so I'll, I'll put maybe a piece of ice in there or just kind of spend a little bit more time with it to make sure. And, and so inevitably I'll come back and give her uh, my taste. I'm very proud of my tasting notes. I don't know if she reads them, um, but uh, I'll give those to her. And, and hopefully uh, from there, we, we basically, um, we go, we go from there. We'll, she'll get, I'll usually have about 15 to 16 barrels and we'll pick eight or nine. We won't uh, ask her to rate your tasting notes, though. Please don't. No, we yeah. wouldn't do that. A lot of people forget that Old Forester really was the basis for Brown Foreman. It's been, uh, I had to see the term overshadowed probably in the last 50 years by Jack Daniels and then yeah. the last 20 years by Woodford Reserve. But it's nice to see Old Forester getting some love again with the new distillery down on Whiskey Row and new expressions like this, because it really is the genesis of Brown Foreman, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, obviously, I, I mean, but uh, I think it's been great. And, it, you know, it was interesting when I was approached um, to take this role, you know, I was on the sales side of our business looking after the U.S., uh, the West, uh, Midwest and, and, um, and Canada and uh, really enjoying it. And I was a little skeptical uh, about jumping back into a marketing role and, and old Forrester and really, you know, what was it that we were going to try and do differently? Cause we'd been at this for a while and, and there had been continued interest in the brand, but um, it had waned, as you said, over the last 50 years and sitting down with actually my brother and, and Paul Varga at the time, Lawson Whiting, who's now our, our CEO and walking through kind of the vision that was being laid out and the ideas of like the, you know, just coming, having a very honest conversation about what we, where we had maybe, you know, not failed the brand, but where we probably now had an opportunity to do some things that we could have done earlier. We were going to do it and we were going to go give it a, a home place. And, and so the, you know, we had purchased that land downtown on main street and, plans were being put together and, and they wanted somebody in there to help lead that project. And we were going to go spend some money against the brand um, more than we had in, in quite a long time. I had actually sat through a sales meeting where the brand team had presented to us the typical annual plan and they landed on this innovation slide, which, you know, other than really birthday bourbon. We hadn't had much innovation and I saw 1870 and I was like, what is that? Like, Oh, this is a, a whiskey roll. We, we want to come out with a, a premium extension that lays tribute to some of the expressions or the methods or time um, during 150, you know, what at that time, 140 year or 45 year history. And I was like, Oh my God, that's genius. I mean, finally, We've got some really interesting ideas and people willing to go do it. Um, and so I was really, it was so exciting to, to, to be able to kind of step into a role that had some momentum that I, I frankly, I wasn't aware of. And then we've had some real consumer acceptance and, uh, with that Whiskey Rose series. In addition, you know, the work we've done on just getting the product more available and, and taking advantage of, of some really kind bartenders and, and, and bloggers and, and, and writers and, and, uh, and, and uh, influencers in our world of bourbon and begin to kind of leverage some of that. And it's been uh, a really fun run for us. 
as you know, we've seen the brand obviously continue to grow in Kentucky. Um, and then in, you know, outside non-traditional bourbon markets, it's done very well. We're, we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in the brand um, outside of uh, North America today. And a lot of that is, we're seeing that in the category, right? Bourbon is, is, is an interesting category. People's palates across the world are becoming a little bit more open to um, the, uh, the layers that whiskey and bourbon in particular can deliver. Um, and the mixability that bourbons and, uh, offer as well, I think, has been, has been a big help in, in the cocktail culture. So we're kind of in this really wonderful place. Uh, it's all working well. And I think we've made up for some lost ground, but we certainly have a lot still to do. And, and that's part of why this is a fun 150th for us, because you want to be able to celebrate what all the people that have done before you. And when you can do that at a time when your brand is doing so well, it gives you a nice perspective as to what the future could could hold for the next generation or the next group of of uh, brand directors and managers and, and distillers and, and tasters and everybody else. So it's just a really fun time to be doing this other than a little pandemic. <laughs> when do you reopen the distillery? down on Whiskey Road to the public. I know it's been closed since uh, pretty much uh, mid-March, early April. Right. But, uh, when do you plan to reopen it or even start thinking about it? Because you're producing there, so it's kind of hard to run tourists through there and keep your staff safe. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's the big consideration is that you've got to protect uh, the folks that actually have to be in there every day and, and that are that are, you know, bottling and blending and and they're they're certainly we're processing we do all our single barrels out of there um and so we're that's our number one priority uh, and then the health and safety of of anybody that comes down there and, and visits us and so i think at this stage we'll continue to evaluate things um we've had some success with this uh curbside sales different things and which has i think been fun for people that have had a chance to get in on it. Um, and so I think we want to continue to do, to do some of that. Um, and I think we'll, you know, we'll explore some simple, easy, safe ways to begin to test our, um, you know, our processes down there in terms of introducing, um, you know, visitors. And that could take the form of, you know, special tastings, uh, maybe a, you know, a, a presentation or two down there. We'll just, we'll do it slowly and, and evaluate. And we're in no rush um, to, to kind of do that. I, I think we're, we're really focused on making sure people are comfortable um, being in there. And then the people that we have in there that have to be in there, that they're comfortable having everybody in there. And, and um, we just, that, that's kind of the, the number one objective. Last question. There's another Kingsman movie coming out. Um, how come we didn't get to see you in a cameo role in the last one since it was so bourbon focused and you were a consultant on it? Because uh, they wanted actors. Um, I think the uh, yeah, that was never on the table. It was probably why we were able to get the deal done, because uh, we didn't do that. One of the guys I work with here who was part of the uh, group that we put this together it actually runs our entire U.S. and Canada business, John Hayes. When we were meeting with um, the director in London and talking to them, they loved his accent. And so they're like, we, we want um, – it wasn't Jeff Bridges, one of the other actors. Like, he's got to speak like your guy, John Hayes. And so John, uh, I think, sent them some uh, recordings of his voice, which, I mean, I think the reality of me getting beat out by John Hayes on even a appropriate voice um, was enough to – make sure that I never would uh, ever ask to be in, in somebody's film, no matter how small the role. But yeah, we've got the, the third one. The, it's actually a prequel is coming out in, um, uh, I think, in February now. And I know they're working with your uh, sister brand, Glendronic, yep. for that one. So uh, we're not going to see any bourbon in that one, right? No, you will. Yeah, we're in there. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't read it, uh, the script. But uh, I've been assured that there is uh, some statesman in that film. We'll have to look for it then. Yeah. Thanks to Campbell Brown for joining us on this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskeys, 
comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. There was one of the Old Forester 150th Anniversary Small Batch Bourbons that I had not tasted until after I talked with Campbell Brown, and if I had to pick a favorite, batch number two would be it by a nose. It's bottled at 63.2% ABV, and the nose has notes of toasted caramel, leather, pipe tobacco, honey, vanilla, and a touch of oak. The taste is thick, chewy, and peppery with a hint of chili powder, honey, caramel, and oak tannins underneath. Water opens up a touch of dark chocolate on the palate and tamps down the spices just a bit. The finish is long and slightly astringent with lingering touches of spices and honey. I'm scoring batch number two of the Old Forester 150th Anniversary Small Batch Bourbon a 93. Now, while Old Forester has a long and storied history, Fresh Bourbon is just starting to write its story. Sean and Tia Edwards are building one of Kentucky's first black-owned distilleries in Lexington, and they've been working with the Hartsfield & Company Distillery in Paris, Kentucky, to create their first batch of Fresh Bourbon to be released in the coming months. I received a sample of that first release, It's between four and six months old, distilled from a mash of 60% corn, 20% honey malt, 10% malted wheat, and 10% rye. It's bottled at 47.5% ABV. The nose has notes of roasted corn, fresh fruits, honeycomb, and a hint of charred oak. The taste has touches of spice, cherry cola, vanilla, oak tannins, and peaches. The finish is medium length with touches of cocoa, peaches, cherry cola, and vanilla. It is young, but still very drinkable, and I can't wait to see how it changes as they release older versions. For now, I'm scoring the first release of Fresh Bourbon, an 87. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first... This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They'll be releasing the next batch of Penny's Proof soon. It's a preview of Sagamore Spirit Whiskey distilled on site in Baltimore. Last year's first release of samples sold out in just hours. And the only way to find out when and how to get your hands on this year's batch is to join Sagamore Spirit's Whiskey Thieves. Sign up today at sagamorespirit.com. I mentioned the Celt Irish Whiskey from the Celtic Whiskey Shop in Dublin a few weeks ago during the news. Ali Alpine and his team have been bottling premium single cask releases under the Celtic cask label for a few years now, and the Celt is their attempt to bottle an Irish whiskey for mainstream consumers. This one is a single malt from an undisclosed Irish distillery, finished in a sherry cask and bottled at 46% ABV. The nose is warm and inviting, with dates, plums, raisins, and toasted caramel. The sherry cask influence comes out strongly on the palate, with notes of plums, figs, toffee, and raisins, along with brown sugar and a hint of molasses. The finish... It's long and sherried. I'm scoring the debut release of the Celt Irish Single Malt Whiskey, a 91. I also mentioned Aberfeldy's new 18-year-old Polyak red wine cask finish recently. It's just arriving now in the U.S. and a handful of other markets. The whiskey was matured in a combination of first-fill ex-bourbon barrels, along with refill and recharred barrels for 18 years then finished for several months in the Polyac casks from the Bordeaux region of France. It's bottled at 43% ABV. The nose has notes of blackberries, black cherries, red grapes, and hints of cedar shavings and honey in the background. 
The taste is fruity and complex. Blackberries, black cherries, and a hint of plums are complemented nicely by hints of cedar shavings and pine needles in the background, while honey and vanilla beans add complexity. The finish is long and fruity, with subtle hints of spices and smoked almonds. I'm scoring the Aberfeldy 18-year-old Polyak cask finish a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of almost 3,000 different whiskeys from around the world. You can check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Gabriel Cartarella again, the doer's guy. I've seen a lot in my years as brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch. Like the time I got a hold of an actual letter written by Andrew Carnegie. A letter from 1891, in it asking doers to ship a keg of whiskey to President Benjamin Harrison at the White House. Spoiler alert, we did. And the bourbon folks were not too happy about it. Pretty cool, right? Well, here's another story for you. In 2019, our master blender, Stephanie McLeod, became the first woman to be awarded Master Blender of the Year by the International Whiskey Competition. And a year after that, she won it again. Stephanie's first creation for Dewar's, Dewar's 15 year, is another piece of history. Sweet, floral, with notes of honey and toffee, a perfectly balanced addition to the Dewar's lineup. It's a great introduction to scotch for beginners, and it's more than complex enough to satisfy whiskey aficionados. So grab some Dewar's 15, call some friends, and make a few stories of your own. That's what a good bottle of whiskey is all about. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. The last time around, I mentioned that our podcast was coming out on the same day as the first anniversary of those U.S. whiskey tariffs on single malts from Scotland and Northern Ireland, along with Irish cream liqueurs and similar liqueurs and cordials from all over Europe. Paul Willenberg, at pwillen1 on Twitter, tweeted this response, This is exactly what happens when you raise taxes. The best you can hope for is revenue neutral. Instead, the U.S. actually lost money. Remember, a tariff is just like a tax, except that it's imposed on the value of something that is being imported. And it's the U.S. importer that actually pays that tax, not the producer or the country where it was exported from. As Raj Sabarwal at Whiskey Raj of Glass Revolution Imports in North Carolina pointed out on Twitter, certainly not a happy anniversary. The tariffs have affected what we import, focusing on single grains and blended malts. However, we do have a shipment of single malt scotch arriving soon, paying $12,500 in tariffs. Who does that benefit? Of course, the same thing is true on the other side of the Atlantic, where European importers have had to pay similar tariffs when they import bourbons and other American whiskies. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has pledged to remove the UK's 25% tariff on those whiskies as soon as the UK leaves the European Union completely at the end of the year. And DiFi at D-I-I-F-I-I tweeted this, Now the same people will lower that tax and pretend like they're the heroes, saving the UK after Brexit. And Ken R. at Ken R. 387-29986 posed this question. I thought Irish whiskey was unaffected. In I, Northern Ireland, whiskey is classified as Irish as per the GI, hence the question. I can see where this is confusing. GI refers to geographical indication, and yes, whiskey made anywhere on the island of Ireland can be called Irish whiskey, whether it's in the Republic of Ireland or the six counties that make up Northern Ireland. It's the one case where the same regional term applies to whiskeys made in two separate countries. But geographical indication does not count in this case, since customs duties depend on which country a whiskey actually comes from, and since Northern Ireland is part of Great Britain, its single malts do fall under the U.S. tariff scheme. 
But as we heard earlier during the news, almost all of Northern Ireland's whiskey exports to the U.S. are blends, which are not subject to the tariff. If you have a question, a suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, well, you can always find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that all make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Word of mouth is the best advertising money can buy. Unless, of course, one could actually get an ad on money. Okay, no one's ever actually tried to put an ad on currency before, at least legally. But for the last 12 years or so, Northern Ireland's Old Bushmills Distillery has had the next best thing. An image of the distillery on the back of every Bank of Ireland banknote. This is going to confuse people who live in the U.S. and other countries where the nation's central bank is responsible for issuing currency. But in Great Britain, a handful of banks in Scotland and Northern Ireland have the legal right to print their own money that circulates alongside the Bank of England's pound sterling notes at the same value. The Bank of Ireland group is based in Dublin, but has a separate business unit in Northern Ireland that issues its own pound-based currency. Back in 2008, the Bank of Ireland started issuing notes with an image of the old Bushmills distillery on the back to celebrate the 400th anniversary of legal distilling at Bushmills in County Antrim. Last year, the bank started issuing new polymer-based 5- and 10-pound notes to replace the old paper ones, but kept the same basic design along with the paper-based 20- and 50-pound notes. Jack Ferris is the Bushmills' U.S. brand ambassador and bragged about it a bit on that call with Whiskey Riders Wednesday. The thing I love telling the Americans is the fact that just in the $20 bill is the White House, one of the most powerful buildings in the United States, one of the most recognizable buildings uh, around the world. What one of our banks decided to do was put Bushmills Distillery on there. So it just highlights Bushmills. It's not just a brand. It's not just a distillery. It is a village, it is a place, it is a people. And it is such a rich and long heritage, something we've been through to keep, you know, to our predecessors again. And that's a lot of pressure on us because they never let us down. We can't let them down. There is only one bank note issued by the Bank of Ireland that does not have the Bushmills distillery featured on it. The 100-pound note has an image of Queen's University in Belfast. Owning a distillery is not a license to print money, but in the right circumstances, the money just might be as good as word of mouth. If there's something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. A unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey, combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news. My tasting notes, calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We'd love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. At Doers, we love a good story, and that's why we're always writing new chapters. Like our illegal smooth finished in Mezcal casts, with notes of sliced green pepper and a wisp of smoke, 
a world's first, Illegal brings cultures together for something truly unique. As a 174-year-old brand, we could rest on our laurels. Instead, we'd much rather continue writing. Because when you keep telling the same old story, that's when people stop listening. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.